Hi, and welcome to Maths Appeal. I'm Bobby Seagull. And I'm Susan O'Kreke. We started Maths Appeal, the podcast, because we are maths teachers that love this subject and also know that it doesn't have a very good rep. So we thought we'd create a space where we can talk about maths. It's a space for students, for teachers, for parents, for people who just want to brush up on their maths knowledge. And who wouldn't want to? Thank you for taking the time to download this podcast and we really appreciate your support in helping to spread the word. So if you can subscribe or give us a nice rating, a really good one would be better, that would be brilliant. So if you want to find out more about us and our math stories, or if you want to find some useful math learning resources, find us on Twitter and Instagram. We are at Maths Appeal. So what normally happens in a podcast, we have a typical structure. We will start off with a discussion uh, looking at a fundamental maths topic. Uh, This week it's percentages. Then Bobby, who's a massive, massive fan of puzzles, will set us a puzzle that we'll get a chance to try. Uh, Then we interview a a guest who has a connection with mathematics. And this week it's Gareth Jones or Gaz Top. From uh, the wonderful programme How To. Uh, And then we go back to the puzzle where we talk through the solution because there's no point in having a puzzle without an answer, right Bobby? Of course not. And then we finish off with a cool bit of maths trivia. So let's get stuck into the maths section where we talk about uh, a key topic. Today our topic is percentages. How this section normally works is we there's three kind of key questions that Bobby and I have had a chance to think about. First, what comes to mind when we think of this topic? Then we think about how we, as two different teachers, deliver this topic and kind of some of the issues that might come up. And then we also think about some of the misconceptions that sometimes arise with this topic. So, percentages. So what comes first to mind? Well, I was like, for me, I like etymology, so the word breakdown says so per cent. And Wikipedia reliably informs me that it comes from the Latin <laughs> per centum, which is by the hundred. And then the Italians used a, a term called per cento, which is very similar. Um, and it comes up with this concept of something out of a hundred. Mm. Um, and interestingly, just sort of, and it's not the cool fact time, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have a decimal system, but they used fractions sometimes in multiples of one hundredth. Oh. So there was a guy, a chap called Augustus, and when he did a tax uh, on goods sold at auctions, he would tax one hundredth, so a percent. Oh wow! Yeah, so before percentages came about, they were using it without really calling it. Well, that's the thing. So with when I I love teaching this subject because so many people hate it, <laughs> but then you know, like having taught it for so many years, it kind of is one of those things. Where now I see so many connections that I just love to share them. So, so the whole idea of percent means out of a hundred, which also connects to fractions. So effectively, a percent is just a special fraction that has denominator, the bottom number, as 100. So 13% is literally 13 over 100. So it's something that's been shared 100 times and you've taken 13 of those shares. And that kind of is, it's a special type of fraction, which a lot of people don't really remember, know, which is really a shame because actually it's a great thing to think about the connection with fractions, but also it's about how do we do comparisons of things that are different we're looking at percentages because you can look at what is that proportion in 100. Yeah, like was it fractions, decimals, percentages? Often I try and teach those topics in quite in a sort of similar time period because they are very much linked to each other. Yeah, and I think actually understanding that relationship can make your use of these tools, effectively these certain number things, much easier. So like a big connection is the whole idea that percentages and decimals look very similar. They do. Um, and in terms of when I try and teach the topic, I've recently started using a 10 by 10 grid. Oh, right. So then kids can see that's 100%. Um, so if something's 50%, they'll need to colour half the grid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's 75%, three quarters of the grid. So they can get that. You know, we, uh, we on Maths Appeal, we always like talking about trying to find like a concrete or visual way to get kids to understand. And again, I find that visual representation can make kids think, oh, actually, 50% is a real, it's a, it's a concept beyond just a number. Well, that's, the th- that's again, that's something that I kind of like to do too. So there's there's so many elements of percentage because it's used in so much that we do in our day-to-day lives, you know, yeah. thinking about sales and shops, thinking about, as you say, increases in population, in your wage or whatever. So it's like being able to understand that is really important. But there's like, there's a the stuff you can do using a calculator, but there's also just the conceptual understanding that 50% is 50 out of 100, which is effectively how many 50s are there in 100? There are two. It's a half. So then it's 25%. How many 25s are there in 100? There are four. So it's effectively a quarter. Mm. 20%, that's 20 
out of 100, which is five 20s in so it's 100. A fifth, it's yeah. a fifth. Yeah. And so just knowing that if you see 20%, to find 20% of something, you just divide by five. To find 25% of something, you just divide by four. 10% is another one that's from my favourite. How many 10s in 100? There are 10 tens, so effectively to find 10% of something, you're just dividing by 10. And having those in the back of your mind as easy calculations makes kind of going to your local shop that has a sale and you can work it out quite quickly. Yeah, and I think, I think um, we were with Mike Ellicott from Nas- the National Numeracy Charity and their headline stat is that around 50% of adults have the numeracy skills of a that we'd expect from a primary school child. And, mm. and the question that we've asked before is, what is a 5% increase on £9 an hour? And half the country of adults can't do this basic question. That's even with a calculator, 5% increase on £9. But I think there's so many different... I think some people get quite debilitated by the fact that you can work work that question out in so many ways and they can't remember which one to use. And, you know, you could do it where you find 10% and then half it to find 5%. So that's 90p divided by 2, 45p, then add that onto your original value. Or you could convert your 5% to a decimal, 0.05, and then times that by your 9, and then add that onto your original value. Or you could even use, you could do 1.05. Multipliers. Mm -hmm. uh, But but I think one of the issues that can really occur for a lot of people is the fact that they will have probably been taught percentages in a variety of different ways. You know, like different teachers like doing yeah, things like in different, different ways. Like, again, I might use that visual grid and say that 100% means every single square and this 10 by 10 is coloured. And and then somebody else might have just gone, oh, you divide by 100 then times by whatever the, yeah. the top number is. or um, And that's kind of where we, if we can get teachers and your parents as well to kind of help students understand that it's all connected. They're all the same thing, yeah. But and that's probably where some of the confusion can arise. But again, we will try and put some visuals on our Instagram and Twitter to kind of see some of those connections um, at Matter Appeal, um, where you can see the connection between fractions, decimals and percentages. And knowing that hopefully will help a lot of people understand, you know, that they are quite similar and they can be very useful tools. Yeah, and I'll tell you, one issue that I find with my students is sometimes when percentages are greater than 100%. If I say Ooh, it's like 150%, yeah. they think that's not possible. Can't get 150% on a test. And obviously, uh, again, shops, real life, real life context. Yeah. Something, imagine you buy something for a tenner and you sell it for uh, 25 quid. Yeah. That's a great, that's a hundred, was it? It's 150% profit. So it's in, well, it's a whole idea that percent is, the original is 100% and you can have, smaller than your original you can have more than your original yes. and knowing that more than your original is going to be over a hundred it's kind of it's a discussion around that when the topic is being sort of taught and then it should hopefully be playful because the more kind of we think about the different ways that percentages are used which comes up so often in real life the better for people and I think people should be trying where possible to do their working out even if in a shop if you see a reduction or a you know tax has been added check it work it out see whether that is actually correct because errors can be made and you could be seeing yourself out of money which you know actually we should all be in control of so, so it pays to be good at percentages it really is kind of it's everywhere right yeah. so it, whenever i uh, sort of walk into my class I always have my sports direct bag, uh, as you can see there. Uh, and I always tell my students in you know sports direct or any other shops, you often see signs that say up to ninety percent off. Right. But actually, mm. it's up to ninety percent off. But if they give you a sixty percent reduction, that's still still, that's still up to ninety percent. So be careful. kids need to be aware that it's not just the numbers, but the words around it that have an impact. Mm. Because technically speaking, if something's fifty percent off. It's, it is still up to 90% off, but you need to have that relationship between the verbal part and then the actual numbers as well. It's being savvy to I suppose like businesses, effectively being, being very clever with language. And also you as an individual, as a consumer as well, kind of this turned into a bit of a money thing, but actually being able to work out these basic, these simple things to, that people aren't taking advantage of you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like, you know, as you say, like, reading and saying anything that says up to means anything that's below that. Yes. So there might not even be a discount or a discount could be 1%. So like work that out and make sure you read everything and being able to work out percentages is power because you can then work out whether someone is trying to take advantage. Yeah, I almost think this is one of the, perhaps one of the most practically important topics mm. that a school child will learn 
in mathematics? If ever any student asks, sort of, what's the point of this? Oh. I love it. I'm just like, I think you'll find it's everywhere. And you really, 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 really should be able to do this. So be quiet and listen. <laughs> so you've heard it here first, or maybe not first, percentages are everywhere. So let's see whether you've got a puzzle for us to test that, Bobby. Okay, a puzzle time. So you... <laughs> That's you, Susan. Oh, hi. Enter a music <laughs> shop and you find out that their top selling albums are for the musicians Beyonce, Justin Bieber, and Lady Gaga. And you're told that Beyonce sales are 50% larger than Lady Gaga and that Justin Bieber sales are 25% larger than Lady Gaga. Right. So your question is Beyonce is what percent larger than Justin Bieber's sales? Okay, one more time. So you need the numbers. Okay, so um, you're in a music shop. Mm -hmm. uh, their best-selling albums are for Beyonce, Justin Bieber and Lady Gaga. Uh, Beyonce sales are 50% larger than Lady Gaga. Sure. And Justin Bieber sales are 25% larger than Lady Gaga. So you have to work out Beyonce is what percent larger than Justin Bieber. All right, so my relationship between Beyonce and Justin Bieber. Yeah, which we don't have any right now, but... <laughs> we'll find out soon yeah. so now it's time for our interview so while you're working out the puzzle let's hear from Gareth Jones you might remember him as Gaz Top off the telly I used to love watching him on How To oh. it was a great show that I feel really made science fun and accessible it really got me involved I, I loved that show and I think you can hear Gareth's sense of enthusiasm in the interview However, I should say that you can also hear quite a lot of noise in the background. We met Gareth in quite a busy cafe, so you'll hear drinks being made in the background and other customers talking and a couple of crying babies, but bear with us. Over to Gareth. My name is Gareth Jones. Uh, I'm a, a, well, a former television presenter, a producer, a podcaster, and I do lots of sort of science, engineering and technology. I have a background in science and engineering. My dad was an electronics engineer. Uh, I grew up in North Wales where we have this tradition of performance. There's this thing called the Esteddfod. All Welsh kids are expected to perform. So if you put those two things together, you know, a background in science and engineering, the ability to perform, you end up being a sort of a science television <laughs> communicator. Um, uh, the other version of the story is that I came in through rock and roll. Uh, I was a roadie guitar tech, went around the world with a band and and that's another place where sort of engineering and performance meet up and ultimately uh, one day was asked to be a TV presenter on an American TV show. Someone had spotted me and I turned it down because my priority was the band I work for. Wow. But then when I got back to the UK I heard about a music channel that were looking for presenters yeah. and I was qualified because I could talk about music having been a roadie for five years got that job and as soon as I was on television I started talking about the stuff I'm passionate about so I started making programs about science and engineering got picked up for Saturday morning television got spotted on a channel an obscure cable channel and as soon as I got onto ITV um, the producer I was working with uh, was casting for a, a show called the How To oh, yes. which is a revival of how a show which had been on in the 60s which I used to watch as a child oh right so uh, was it, it was a revival yeah yeah that's why it was called how to ah. it wasn't how to do something it was like the next generation of how wow. and uh, and Fred Dynage who was one of the presenters of that show had been one of the presenters on the original version of how he was one of my heroes uh, I got to work with him and I ended up doing that show for 16 years with Fred so it was on TV for 16 years yeah 89 to 2005 which is a ridiculous run isn't it really it's a fantastic run isn't it? so had, so there was so much involvement for people who say didn't watch it can you Maybe explain what went on in the show? Yeah. Um, how was basically show and tell. You know, if you invite students in a class to bring something in the next day, stand up in front of the class and explain what it is that they've got and why it's interesting or how it's interesting or how it works, that's essentially what how was. Every item in the show would be a question led by the word how. For instance, how do you make a podcast? You know, how do you get an egg into a bottle? How do you make a table? How, you know, any, it could be any question, as long as it starts with the word how. And um, there were three presenters on the show, me, Fred Dynage, and Carol Vorderman, on the initial run of the show. It changed over the years. 
there was a team uh, who made the show that we had researchers, producers, directors, prop makers. But I also brought lots of material to the show as well. Um, the sort of people who get chosen to be podcasters, broadcasters, you turn up with ideas. You know, the last person to employ is someone who says, tell me where to stand, tell me what to say. What you want to is someone who walks in the room and says, oh, I've been thinking about this, why can't we do a thing about this? And, you know, you, it's like turning up at the party with a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> ready to get involved yeah yeah, yeah yeah you bring you know don't expect bring yeah. so I brought lots of uh, content to the show I think in every episode of how right. there would have been one how one item which I would have contributed to the pot and it wasn't always a, sh uh, a how which I presented it was often something that Carol did or Fred or any of the other presenters we had on the show over its 16 year run. Uh, and it seems that you have a real love of technology. Though. I think that's a, simply a function of my age. I was born 12 weeks after man first went into space. April the 12th, uh, 1961, Yuri Gagarin made his first flight. I was born in July, so I am a child of the space age. You know, space travel was the future, and that's driven by technology and our command of technology. And even to this day, as we approach the 50th anniversary of that moon landing, I watched it live. I'm so old, I watched it live. My dad woke me up in the middle of the night. I watched it and went out into the garden to look at the moon that night. So it, it, it's a real event for me. So science, engineering, technology, mathematics, the understanding of the universe, for me, it's not necessarily something that other people do, it's personal. And I, I have to admit, I'm not a great mathematician, I'm a reasonable mathematician, but I always defer my knowledge of maths to my great friend Zog, who knows more than me about these things, or even my son Indigo, he's a great mathematician. And that always happens. People tend to defer their knowledge of something to those who know more than you. For instance, you'll always know a Bowie fan, someone who knows more about Bowie than you. Yeah? I'll tell you. And we all love Bowie, <laughs> yeah. but there'll always be someone who's the Bowie fan. Yeah. And that's okay, as long as you've got access to the answers. Oh, which was Bowie's best album? You know, which which was released first? And it's the same with maths. You know, you know how do you express this? You'll be able to turn to someone for the answers. Because we live in a different age now. Once upon a time, you had to know the answers yourself. Now, you can access the answers instantly via the global net. The information age has changed what you need to know. Oh, huge thank you to Gareth Jones there. It was so lovely to meet him and find out about his maths and science journey. Such an enthusiastic guy. He told me his memories about him, his time at school, and he told some mad stuff about they had to learn their times, they had to recite their times tables outside in the cold in North Wales. Oh, God. It's changed a little bit. It has, just a little bit. Um, first, I want to say I'm, I'm so jealous that you got to meet him because <laughs> at first when you mentioned Gareth Jones, I'll be honest, like, I have a friend called Gareth Jones. Oh, you've got so a I, common name, actually. Yeah, so I was thinking, <laughs> uh, and then when he, when he said he was a how-to guy, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. So, he, you know, he, at least I've, I know someone that's now interviewed my one of my childhood idols. So. <sighs> Oh, he's such he, honestly such a lovely guy and so enthusiastic about science and and, and technology um, and just also like the democratization of science and technology the fact that it's it's not just for scientists it's for everybody yeah and I always find interesting how he talked about he was a child of the space race the yeah, space age yeah. how being born in the sixties and when there was a drive like countries to show their their ambition by creating space programs and rockets and actually mm. growing up and that story about him listening uh, or watching the moon landing and coming out and looking at the moon and it's, thinking God but that's so mad isn't it because we, we're in a time now where technology is just such a part of what we do that um, to, to kind of witness that change must be kind of crazy because so much stuff we take for granted that actually has revolutionised the world we live in mm. you know? So even like this pen I'm holding in my hand I remember <laughs> reading somewhere saying that there's no one person in the world. It's a really basic bio pen could Shiny. make this pen. Oh right. Because every single component has someone spe you know, someone makes the ink, mm. someone makes the, the plastics, someone makes the, the, the I don't know, the metal, the coils, the springy Inside coils. It, yeah. Someone knows how to distribute it. So it shows like we don't need to know everything, even in mathematics, mm. as long as you understand enough so that you can ask you know what question to ask someone else or what to look up. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of the key things he said, which really kind of shifted something in me as a teacher. It's like, actually, 
I know that it's not just about me saying stuff and then people like learning it and that's it. It's like it's also about us learning from our students. Um, but also we are no longer the font- fonts of all knowledge. It used to be that a teacher would say something or your parents would say something that was gospel. And now you've got Google. <laughs> yes, kids can, it always makes me think, because now kids, if they don't understand something in class, they can use things like the Khan Academy, mm, um, exactly. you know, Barton Hegarty Maths, Hegarty Maths, Maths yeah. Yeah. all these different resources where they can find another way of trying to crack a nut in their head, as it were. To understand things. I think that's the, I think actually that's what was really interesting and really thought provoking from what Gareth said was the fact that it's not about the answer, it's about the question. It's kind of encouraging people to question. So the information they might have at their fingertips, actually where is it from, or also getting them to think, what do I want to know? What can I get better at? And actually utilising technology to do that, you know, which is kind of this incredibly, as I say, democratising time we're in, but it kind of involves people being enthusiastic and using their initiative to do that. Yeah, like sometimes with my students, if they're doing a GCSE question at home and revising mm. and they don't understand, they will Google, they will type out the keywords. Sometimes they're lucky they'll find the actual question. Oh, yeah, there's so many worked <laughs> examples now. Of, of yeah. the, and sometimes you get worked examples of the actual question. <laughs> <laughs> they're so lucky. Yeah. Uh, but it's kind of, again, it's how you use it. So it's almost like it's no, in some respects, they might be d- done a disservice because instead of them thinking, how do I do it? How can I check it? They're just like, here's the answer and that's it. And that's not kind of what you want. It's about getting people to be active thinkers and that's kind of what the next challenge is isn't it it's not just about can you do something it's like actually you might be able to do something technology can probably do it better Mm. what can you add to what technology is doing or what different kind of way of thinking can you bring as a human that can challenge technology or to make technology better and that's kind of the next phase of where we're at i think it is and as mathematicians is to help people develop that thinking that toolkit in the head. Mm. So even if you can't solve it, you know, you can start thinking, oh, what are the key things here? What process do I need to follow? So adding, you know, we've got the, the, the key skills in maths and using that to, I don't know, use technology, finding this, like, this combination where you've got tech and you can access things on Google, but you've got the basic skills of maths there. So you yeah. can sort of move yourself forward. Um, so I think it's just the moral from that is we need to educate people so they can access the information so they might not know everything because we don't need to yeah. as long as they can access it then they're equally empowered or actually more empowered as long as they're critical yeah the, the critical thinking and asking good questions exactly so in the interview what Gas described himself as a podcaster and what he he's a actually a podcast pioneer yeah he is um so his podcast what was it called again it's called Gareth Jones on speed uh, and he's been doing it for uh, was it 15 years that's amazing yeah uh, and it's yeah what is it on it's on his cars and... so on cars and motor sports and he's you know it's it's really quite funny listen as well so he's really passionate good kind of following of people so if you're interested in cars and motorsports give it a good listen We're going to hear a maths fact from Gareth just before the end of the podcast. But for now, let's get back to the puzzle. So let me remind you of what our puzzle was. So it's where Susan enters a music shop and she finds out that the top selling albums are for the musicians Beyonce, Justin Bieber and Lady Gaga. Uh, And uh, we're told that Beyonce sales are 50% larger than Lady Gaga sales. And we're also told that Justin Bieber sales are 25% larger and Lady Gaga. So your puzzle question was, um, Beyonce sales is what percentage or are what percentage larger than Justin Bieber? Okay. How did you do? Right, so what I started off with, I sort of saw from the question that Lady Gaga is effectively our 100% because Beyonce is 50% more than Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber is 25% more than Lady Gaga. So that's our initial. Lady Gaga is effectively a main percentage, yeah. 100%. And so then for, for Beyonce, the total percentage based on Lady Gaga is 150%. And then for Justin Bieber, the total percentage is 125%, right? Yeah, you got music ever. Yeah, and so then the difference between Beyonce and Justin Bieber is 25%. And so then... We had to have a discussion about this, didn't yeah. we? So it's like working out what uh, the Beyonce percentage is compared to Justin Bieber, mm. not compared to Lady Gaga. Mm. So I then did the difference of 25% divided 
divided by the Justin Bieber percentage, which is 125%, mm, which is 20%. Correct, that's right. Is that what you got as well? Exactly, yeah. So just making sure that you have to re-shift sort of shift your scale back so that 125% of Justin Bieber actually need to scale that, it back to 100 as it were. So that becomes our new original value. So the key thing is with percentages is what is your original? Yes. And remember to go back to what's the question asking. Exactly. So, yeah. And that's where I, I was a bit like, ooh, is it 25 over, uh, is it just 25% because that's our difference? But then it's actually no... It's 25 out of the 125. Yeah, from like, Justin Bieber. And it gives us 20%. Yeah. And then you can question why you're going to a shop with Beyonce, <laughs> Justin Bieber and Lady Gaga. That's another time. <laughs> that's, that's another question. Uh, that's you. That's you. You're, you're the one walking into that shop, not me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. <laughs> Thanks for the puzzle. Most appreciated. But before we go, how about one final bit of trivia for maths? So this week's maths fact comes courtesy of Gareth Jones. You know pi is Welsh, do you know this? No. Yeah, I know we all think it's Greek, but actually the use of the symbol pi was uh, invented by a, a Welshman. This is, it should have done this on air. Really, it's it's yeah. amazing. Uh, his name was uh, William Jones. Uh, he wrote a book, I think, around about early 1700s. Right. Uh, it was written in Greek or Latin, part of it. But he was the first person to use, actually he wasn't the first person to use, he was the first person to popularise the use of the symbol pi as opposed to an equation to represent the relationship between the radius and the circumference of a circle. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've always claimed pi as Welsh. Oh, wow. Yeah, William okay. Jones, he was from Benflech, which is uh, a great name for a town, that's isn't a it? fantastic name. Yeah, from North Wales, like me. Like oh, me. wonderful. Yeah. Okay, well, that's something to definitely it's a good factoid. Great factoid. Who knew pi was Welsh? You might have to be careful. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who might contest that, but oh, I'd love yeah. to hear from people. Yeah. Um, one of the things as well, like, I love the number pi. So amazing that um, I, whenever we talk, whenever people talk about pi, I can't help but say about a year seven student that I once taught, uh, uh, and one of the challenges was to learn because pi goes on to infinity. It does, yeah. it's a mad number, uh, and one of the challenges was to learn as many digits of pi as possible. And she learned 147 digits. Well, that's the maximum break in the snooker as well, one four seven. <laughs> that's you, why she picked, and the bus that I could get. To school, sort of, in a long-winded way, the 147. Who knew? The Who one, knew? But 147 is such an incredible number and connected to pi and buses. Exactly. And just for one point of clarification in terms of pi, I remember once a, a friend in my class used to, used to be convinced that pi was 22 over 7, but that's just an approximation. Ah, uh, yes. And yes. to this day, my friend says, pi is 22 over 7. No, no, no. no, it's, no. It's, 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 yeah, well, that's 3.142857, which is correct for two decimal places, but it's just a good approximation. And that's why computers have revolutionised Pi for us, haven't they? Um, right, so if you have any uh, maths facts for us, please do get in touch with us on Twitter or Instagram at Maths Appeal. We want to hear more. And that's it from us. Uh, thanks again for downloading this episode of Maths Appeal. And if you'd like to give us a five-star rating <laughs> or tell your friends about us, that would be amazing. And our guest in next week's podcast is the comedian Ken Cheng. He studied maths at Cambridge University, but dropped out to become a professional online poker player and is currently on tour across the UK with his comedy show, Best Dad Ever. Well, I can't wait to hear about his story. Sounds pretty exciting. Uh, well, you've been listening to Maths Appeal with me, Bobby Seagull and Susan Okereke. And the music was composed by Kelly Okereke, the image designed by Calix Davis and our wonderful producer is Jenny Nelson. Mm-hmm.